prolific printmaker and like other important painters concerned with their professional fame before him, uh, he took advantage of the printmaking technologies mm -hmm. in order to really proliferate and promulgate his, his, his work. work. Right. And in fact, I think Rembrandt knew about a lot of other artists' work through collecting prints sure. and, and think, in fact, that he owned a print, for example, of Leonardo's Last Supper. Mm -hmm. So clearly it was a way to disseminate your work. Right. Yeah. And he works in a lot of different media uh, in terms of print. And here we're looking at a particular one called the Three Crosses. This is an etching and dry point, and it's dated to 1653. And Christ was crucified at the same time as two other... Christ was crucified at the same time as two thieves, uh, okay. who we see on the right and the left, a good thief and a bad thief. And the moment that's being represented here is really of Christ's death, uh, as the sky darkens and light shines directly above from heaven, uh, as the sky is closing in dark on the sides, and Christ is turning his head up to heaven and saying, uh, Father, why have you forsaken me? Uh, mm -hmm. And then dies. And Didn't he also say, forgive them, for they know not what they do? There are, right, several, uh, well, according to the different Gospels and the different exegetical right. texts, there's different versions. But in essence, it's the last moment. Mm -hmm. um, and Rembrandt is using all of his skills, as he does in painting, of tenebrism and drama and action to communicate the narrative in this very dramatic way with people running away down on the bottom. Yeah. The Roman uh, soldiers on horseback. Roman soldiers with their weapons on horseback, people kneeling in front of the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary fainted uh, to the right and down below, mm -hmm. figures with, uh, pulling their hair in grief and so on. And other people sort of going about their business. Right, exactly. Right. Um, but maybe we should say a few words about the uh, printmaking practice sure. itself and what's at work here. Uh, as I said, there's two different techniques combined. Uh, it's this etching and dry point, which are two techniques that are very frequently combined together, because both of them are intaglio types of printing, like engraving also, um, where you are cutting the lines into the metal plate that you actually want to print on the paper. You want to carve the lines into the metal that are going to hold the ink, and those lines are then the black lines that you see on the page. So everything that we see here is a line that's been incised into right. the metal plate. Now, Engraving, which we're not looking at here, you simply make the line with the tool. You have a sharp V-shaped tool, you carve a line, and then later that will hold the ink as it goes to the printing press. And etching is a lot more labor intensive, but it has a lot of advantages as well. When you're making an etching, the first thing that's done is that the metal plate is covered with uh, wax. And then you actually make your design, you make your drawing, if you want to call it that, in the wax. You're not actually carving directly into the metal like you do with the other so techniques. So it's not as laborious. It's not as laborious in that sense in terms of making the drawing. You can make a very easy freehand, it looks exactly like a drawing, in fact, mm -hmm. because you're not carving metal, you're right. just dragging your tool through right. wax. So it's a kind it's of freedom. Yeah. It's very loose uh, draftsman-like freedom mm -hmm. uh, to the rendering. And so, for instance, the figures that are running away, Christ on the cross, yeah, these are all like the drawings. things. It looks like a drawing. Yeah. It's probably an etching. Yeah. Uh, versus, again, an engraving, which has a kind of... Um, uh, precise exactitude mm -hmm. to it that you wouldn't confuse for a freehand drawing. Right. So anyway, once you've made your design in the wax, then you submerge the plate in acid. And everywhere that you've made your drawing, the metal has been exposed and the acid is going to eat away at the metal. Mm -hmm. After a little while in there, you take it out, you rinse it off, and then you scrape off the wax, and now you have a plate with the lines incised in it from the acid. So the chemical is really, the acid is doing the etching in exactly. the way, into the plate. Exactly, and you can even get different depth and width of lines because you could put it in, have the acid eat away for a little while, take it out, rinse it off, cover some of the lines with wax and put it in again, oh. and then you'll have those lines that are bitten into twice with the acid even more stark and, uh, and deep. Mm -hmm. um, so that's etching. A dry point is different. A dry point, you are actually working directly into the surface of the metal, and you use what's called a dry point needle, right. and you scratch right into the surface of the metal. And you have to think of it almost in kind of violent terms, because you're not using the very sharp tool that you use with an engraving that gives you the control and precision of that medium. Instead, you're basically, you have to think about kind of scraping across the plate with a nail. <laughs> that's basically wow. what you're doing with a dry point. And so you can tell which parts of the plate have been... Uh, marked with dry point? Right. The shadows in the right and the left, and the darkest shadows by the people in the lower left, those are probably done with dry point because the dry point line is not, not only precise, deep right? and not precise, but also as you drag it across the metal, it creates a burr 
on both sides of the line. In mm. other words, the metal that you Shaving, dig up, sort of. the shavings, exactly, uh, are gathered on each side of the line. And so when you ink up your plate, there's not only going to be ink in the line, the shavings on the side are also going to hold the ink like a sponge. And so a dry point line is very thick and mm -hmm. velvety. It has a kind of furry blackness to it mm -hmm. that's unique to the dry point medium. And so, again, the things that look like drawing, that's etching. And then the areas where you want to get a dramatic velvety darkness, like Rembrandt likes to get, those areas are going to be dry point. So here Rembrandt has combined the etching and the dry point to get the kinds of details, but also the dramatic intensity of the darkness that he wanted to achieve. And it is very, a very dramatic it image. Is, it is very dramatic, but apparently not dramatic enough. Because something else that you can do with prints like this is, after you've made your print, you can go back to the metal plate and change it around. If there's something that you want to eliminate, you can polish the plate down, and that Probably will polish out a, the lines. a certain number of times you can do that, though, before you wear away the plate, right? You, you can get a bunch, though. Uh -huh. I mean, there are examples where artists like Rembrandt even have reworked the plate seven or eight or nine wow. times. Mm -hmm. um, but usually you only do it a couple of times, that's mm -hmm. true. So you can erase things, you can add figures in, you can change the way uh, the line is, if you want to make it darker, if you want to make it lighter, and so on. And then you can print it again, and each time that you make a change and print it, that's called a new state. So it's marvelous, because when you rework an oil paint, you cover up... Right what you've done and, and you know you change it and here you have preserved the original images. Exactly, your first prints are always going to be there so you'll know what the first state, which is the first one that you make looks like. This is the first state of the three crosses and then Rembrandt went in and he changed it and he printed it again and that was the second state and then he went in and changed it and printed it again, the third state again and the fourth state and again is the fifth state which we're looking at right here. Wow. So he's really changed this quite dramatically. For instance, down at the very bottom of the print uh, in the center, there were two figures running away. Let's go back for a second and look at that. Uh, here you see them quite plainly headed in the bottom center, headed the towards foreground. the viewer. And in the fifth state, they're there's gone. one figure on the right, but the one who is right in the center is gone mm -hmm. because Rembrandt wanted to eliminate the distractions, really focus your attention even more dramatically on Christ dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. So of course, there's a lot more dry point on the sides. Right blackening the sides of the print, and, and also, also eliminating figures to enhance the drama. Yeah, and it also creates a sense of kind of chaos mm -hmm. around Christ. So there's this illegible forms and figures yeah. kind of swirling around the cross in the center that emerges from that chaos with this divine light flooding yeah, down absolutely. on it. Sure. It becomes a kind of very uh, powerful image spiritually. Yes, very much so. Look also, uh, look at the members of his family and supporters uh, below and to the right. Virgin yeah. Mary who's fainted, probably John the Evangelist who's clutching his head uh, in grief. Look at them in the fifth state, the hands thrown out to the side yeah. in this expression of grief and awe. Yeah. The way the Virgin Mary's face just seems to be floating in the darkness. And then look on the right side, excuse me, on the left side of the print, uh, the Roman soldiers. Here we see them just kind of standing around, not really doing anything, not really mm -hmm. even paying very much attention. And look at the fifth state. Much on, more menacing. Much more menacing. On the, on the far left, the horse is rearing and riderless, uh, whereas before it had someone sitting on it just kind of standing there. Now it's rearing up on its hind legs, giving it that dramatic effect. And also the two soldiers that are closest to the cross, look at them in the first state. One is facing away and turning and talking mm -hmm. yeah, over his shoulder chatting. to his friend just like he's chatting. The other one's standing there immediately to the left of Christ, not really seeming to have much to do with him. Here, notice how Rembrandt has turned the figure around on the left so that now he faces in on his horse towards Christ, drawing your attention more towards the center. And the soldier immediately to his left is much more menacing. Yeah. Big bulky armor, this thick, thick sword that he's holding, like a giant dagger that seems to be and much more like menacing. he looks like a Star Wars stormtrooper. And he looks exactly really. like a Star Wars stormtrooper, definitely communicating sort of that kind evil. of evil, menacing quality. Yeah. A very moving image. I mean, it's legible in some many ways and its blackness and its forms that have become obscured but in a way all the more more powerful mm -hmm. and you can tell that this is really what Rembrandt is exploring here is mm -hmm. the potential to create that kind of drama and power and mm -hmm. awe through this medium that allows him to change it as yeah. he goes on and I also see in a way two sides of Rembrandt in one the first one that side of Rembrandt that's interested in people and in ordinary people you mm -hmm. know and, and life and everyday life and 
the way that Rembrandt can draw so many different kinds of characters and figures in his in his early work especially but then also that interest in spirituality and psychological mm -hmm. power that's mm -hmm. in this later state. Absolutely, that comes across clearly here. Mm -hmm.